place to make money by reselling stuff. If you can see behind me, I have a whole, a whole slew of things. Uh, got a new label printer, mine broke. Have that for uh, selling hats. There's some video games there. There's some excess sports cards there. Uh, all sorts of fun stuff. And if you want to ask me any questions about how to get started, what to sell, uh, tips, tricks, any of that kind of stuff, I think I can help you. So uh, who is all here in the chat right now? And uh, if you're you know, coming in late, whatever, let me know where you're from. Uh, and if you're watching the replay, we can all, you can always comment below with uh, you know any questions you have, where you're from, what you're doing. Uh, this is you know a community of resellers here, and everyone likes to talk, right? We've got Robert the user, Hollywood reseller, Trey Watson, One Thrift Cookie. What is up? There are currently 12 people here just getting started. Let's give it a big thumbs up if you are in the stream or you're watching uh, the replay. All these go live, or all the lives get posted, I mean. So if you want to uh, listen to these while you work, that is a possibility. Sorry, I got my hat right. My head's kind of bunched up and it's bugging me. So we've got Lisa in Marquette, Nicholas in Massachusetts. Good to hear. Hollywood and North Hollywood reseller. Robert the user in Ypsilanti. Welcome all. So today I've been uh, listing sports cards. Uh, I have a few orders to ship out. Uh, I had about 30 orders over the weekend that went out on Monday. That was kind of a lot of work, but uh, it was all it was all good. Um, I posted a what sold video highlighting the big stuff. I think I had about a thousand dollars in sales, probably a little bit more. Uh, I think the payout was um, for for eBay only was about seven hundred dollars. I have to check my bank account though. I have daily eBay payouts going, and you can have that too if you want. We've got Scotch in the Milwaukee Bur Scott, I mean not Scotch, Scott in the Milwaukee Burbs. How you doing, Scott? So what do you guys uh, want to talk about? What kind of things are you doing? Uh, how can I, you know, what advice can I offer to help you? We've got Punches Resale, who is in the stream now. Uh, so the things that I'll be doing over the next few weeks, uh, I I'm trying to build my eBay store up, both because Amazon is getting more and more difficult to sell things on as a third-party seller, as well as uh, content-wise, eBay content does far better than Amazon content, at least for me that I've noticed that. Uh, we've got Danny in South Florida. Dana Invest says good morning, everyone. Good morning to you too. It's uh, just past noon here in Michigan, but if you're on the East Coast or the West Coast, I mean, uh, then it's definitely uh, morning for you. So uh, we have a question. Hollywood says auctions, eBay auctions, are they worth it? And I think absolutely. I sell tons of things on auctions. Uh, you're not always going to get the most money if you were to hold out for months and months. But sometimes, especially in high demand markets or with very rare items where the supply is extremely low, auctions can be a bit higher than the uh, actual you know, buy it now. An example of that would be, uh, you know, sports cards are the easy thing to talk about right now. We're seeing some sports cards or some sealed cards on auction go, you know, for 20 or 30% above what current buy it now listings are. Why would an auction go above other buy it now listings, especially for something as silly as like sealed sports cards where there's no difference really. Uh, and that's just because people get on tilt and they want to, you know, they want to win the auction. And so they start uh, bidding more and more uh, without checking what other options are. 6.13 a.m. in Hawaii. Wow, that's a ways away. Six hours. Must be uh, okay, on vacation and just got up. Yeah, those first, few, those first few days in Hawaii are always weird. Especially if you're not, you know, if you're from the uh, eastern time zone like I am. Um, you are very, like, jet lagged. But you're in this beautiful area, so you get to use the time. Uh, you know, better. And then you end up just getting sick, right? Because you don't go to sleep really. So you're, you're living like 18 or 19 hour days in your feet. Um, hopefully, you know, that doesn't really happen. But it, I, I'm sure it happens a lot. I saw that uh, Hawaii had restrictions about who could travel there. Um, 
and I think they may have been lifted. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, but when I looked when I looked to buy tickets to go to Hawaii in like January, you had to have a COVID test within two days or within three days of your uh, departure. So we have Dara here from Chicago. Hi from Chi Town, they say. Hello, hello. So uh, why am I working more on eBay and what am I doing? What's my strategy? Well, the main thing I'm doing currently, uh, besides researching things to do and you know looking for other niches to pursue, is listing every day on eBay. I'm listing at least, I'm trying to at least, at le list at least 10 things. And sometimes those 10 things are auctions. Uh, sometimes those 10 things are buy it now. More often than not, they're buy it now. And what like my go-to has been, if, I, if I'm busy or if I'm doing other things, is just to list sports cards. Because you can list about one card a minute, um, I, I can at least, by taking pictures and uploading them onto your computer and doing it that way. If you're doing lots of like 25 or 30 cards, you can really get rolling if they're all the same brand, all the same series, all the same like kind of insert even. So I've been doing that, and I have noticed a huge spike in my eBay traffic uh, both and sales. Um, so I, I think that's working. But what I have to do now is uh, scale up either the amount of things that I list or the profits for things that I list. I had about, so far over the past 31 days, I'm doing about 100 bucks a day in sales on eBay. Um, basically right now my business is like 100 bucks a day on eBay between 100 and 300 on Amazon. And YouTube is going to be between like 50 and 150 bucks a day, depending on, um, you know, if there are super chats or if like a video does very well that day or if a video gets posted, you know, the day before that day. And so I'm right around that sweet spot of like 300 bucks a day, sometimes more, sometimes less in uh, like basically profit. You know, there's the cost of my uh, warehouse and everything, but um, I'm trying to focus on these like $1,000 a week. $100 a day in that range, like side hustles. Because if you have like three or four or five of those, if you're making 500 bucks a day off of five revenue streams, that's pretty good. Um, and, you know, it's not great. It's not like super scalable, I wouldn't say either. But 500 bucks a day is certainly enough for me at this, uh, this you know, juncture in time. Dana says, you have to have two day clean cover test. Took two minutes at a Walgreens drive through so not a big deal. Uh, 10 items a day is awesome for eBay account. It grew my account 21% last month, says Dana. Large electronics are my best seller, averaging about 300 a day. I'm still doing my large electronics on Amazon, but I think, I mean, one of these days I have to go through and take all of the, the items that are getting either no traffic on Amazon or the listing page where it was actually taken down on Amazon. Amazon has been cleaning house on so many old um, ASINs. Uh, and because they control that catalog, they can do that. Whereas on eBay, it's a lot more difficult for eBay just to say like, unless with the, you know, with the exception being like something similar to a Vero strike, it's very difficult for eBay to like take down um, huge swaths of of item listings. We saw it occur about a year and two or three months ago with hand sanitizer and Lysol wipes. But even that was not absolute. Um, you know, in, 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 the, in their ban. And it wasn't even like they were being discretionary. It was just like, I don't think they have the capabilities to remove so many listings all at once. We've got the Sam rat here saying, hello, hello to you too. So we were talking about eBay, talking about more listings and talking about kind of the difficulties. Now, by no means do I want to say that Amazon is like done for or if you haven't created an account, don't create an account. You know, the time to start selling on Amazon is still like yesterday. It's, you know, oh, you know, right now there's still a lot of money to be made. I'm just, you know, I'm, I would say when it comes to business stuff, I'm more cautious. And so I, I, I am taking more time to build up my eBay store. Uh, even though I think that in the, at, you know, in the moment right now, I could still make more on Amazon. But I think five years from now, with the way that I do business, with a lot of used stuff, um, I think that Amazon is probably going to be better for like private labeling maybe, you know, if I if I get back into more of that. But for used electronics that you know, eBay used to be where I would avoid for that stuff because the prices were so low. But I've noticed the prices going up on a lot of stuff. 
um, just because the supply is not available elsewhere. You know, it isn't available on Amazon. It isn't available on Facebook Marketplace. It isn't available on Mercari. It's only available on eBay. Uh, in the back of my head, I've been throwing around the idea of doing a Shopify store for obsolete electronics. And a heavy component might be like drop shipping from like Mercari or Amazon. Um, I think it's kind of a bad idea because you don't have the, uh, you know, drop shipping is even giving it a bit of, I'm just using a similar term because it wouldn't be from a supplier. It'd just be like arbitrage basically. Uh, but that, I think that's actually illegal in some areas to give your customers information to someone else. Um, certain states have laws about what you can and can't do. So, I, I, you know, even though I've thought about that, I would not do it. I'd have to have all the merchandise on hand or with, like, a single supplier. Um, but I don't know. Just, you know, just thoughts I've been having. We've got Bubbles in Florida. Uh, thoughts on decent costume jewelry under $1 a piece when buying the lot for eBay selling. So costume jewelry has no intrinsic value. It's not made of sterling silver or gold or any other precious metal for that matter. It's generally going to be like metal with some sort of like coating on it. Um, like uh, rolled gold, I suppose you'd call costume jewelry. Um, you know, uh, GFE, which is, excuse me, electroplate gold oftentimes. And the electroplating on that gold, on the jewelry is like a micrometer, you know, thick. It's very, very small. So in terms of like, if it doesn't sell, you have no recourse to get your money back really. So I think a dollar per piece is too high in that case, unless you know for a fact, because there is some costume jewelry and I'm not privy to it. I don't sell costume jewelry. I sell sterling silver jewelry and gold jewelry, uh, but not costume jewelry. Um, and there are certain brands and certain styles that do very well. I don't know what those are. If you know what they are, obviously the dollar piece is no big deal. Um, but if you are just trying to like randomly buy them with the intention of reselling them, you might not get a dollar per item, just to be totally honest. Um, you know, you could always say, oh, well, I'll auction them off, and you could auction off the items starting at a dollar a piece, and you mo you'll get some bids, but it's just, um, I don't think, I personally don't know enough about costume jewelry, and every, all the costume jewelry I see is worthless, so, you know, that, that that's what it comes down to. Robert, the user, says, question, I have the ability to buy a lot of clothing that is new, but doesn't have listings on Amazon. What is the best way to sell these? Garage sale, lots by size on eBay, etc. So are they like branded, you know, branded stuff? Is it like, uh, even if it's Walmart brands, even if it's, um, you know, like Sonoma from wherever the heck they, is that Target, is that Walmart? You know, if it's uh, Target brands, Walmart brands, Meyer brands, Kroger brands, you know, any big box store like that, um, you can still sell those items with a pretty decent sell-through rate on eBay individually. And if you have multiple quantities of the same style, um, like let's say you've got the same shirt, 50 pairs, in 50 units in large, medium, and extra large, you can just do quantity listings on eBay. Uh, and it's kind of a bitch to set up, but once you have it set up, it's very easy because all you're doing is really fulfilling orders. You're not taking photos every single day. You're just updating inventory. We've got Jim on Main Street, USA, and Walt Disney World. Uh, I know enough to lose my money. I'm going to pass on them in regards to the costume jewelry. Hollywood Reseller says, I once heard Mexican candy from dollar stores sell well. I'm not sure if true. But would selling candy and other types of snack make good money in your opinion? Absolutely. People buy that kind of stuff all the time. Uh, I've sold imported candy. Um, low margin, but if you can if you can create listings on Amazon, for example, or if you have a listing on eBay that sells 10 a day, uh, it becomes very profitable very fast. A Money says, have you ever done storage or airport auctions? If so... Do you know how to get into an airport auction? I think you just Google it, although probably everything's closed right now. Airport auction uh, near me. Um, I'm just Googling that. And let's see, baggage auctions map is a uh, is a, uh, a website that I went to. Detroit Metropolitan Airport baggage auction. Yeah, so it looks like um, just by Googling it, it looks like that's how you're going to find the best information. I have never gone to an airport auction. I have done uh, 
storage unit auctions, and you, you see them advertised all the time online and uh, outside of these storage unit stores. Um, but I haven't done one in a long time. I just haven't had the desire to go to them. I've been buying some, um, you know, I haven't even bought pallets in a long time. I have so much back stock here to go through. It's going to take me months, if not like, I mean, not a year, but it's going to take me a long time to get through all of this. I haven't bought anything all of June, and I think I went sourcing like twice in May, three times in May, and I'm still, my sales are still increasing because I have so much to choose from here. D's Sell Stuff says, finally made the live show. Well, welcome to uh, your first one. I shared the link on my Facebook page, WBK Ultra, as well as the Facebook group. Uh, so hopefully everyone there is watching. And if you want to join that Facebook group, it's free to join. And um, there's a link below somewhere in the description. Fun for everybody. The, the, uh, you know, we talk about resale stuff. I delete everything that's not related to resale. I delete all the dumb comments I see. For some reason, people always think that it's okay to like, oh, I was making a joke. Like, well, nobody knows you here, so there's no context for what you're really trying to say. Um, and he says, hello, I joined late. What did I miss? Not much. We're just talking about, uh, we talked a little bit about auctions on eBay. Uh, talked about costume jewelry, stuff like that. Anybody sell on Amazon? A lot of us do. I sell on Amazon, but I am kind of moving away. Any update on making a private label product? No update at all. Um, I, it's been, you know, put on the the back burner because I, I, I want to get out of here. This is, you know, the issue that I have is I try to do too many things at once. So I, I just don't have the mental capacity to launch a private little product and clean up my warehouse and clean up my actual house and buy a new house and go to, you know, 10 weddings this summer and all that good stuff, make eBay videos and make Amazon videos. So I have to prioritize. Uh, and the private label stuff is not a priority right now just because over the summer, I don't know. I probably should be um, delegating it, I guess, but I don't have my VAs set up to do that kind of stuff. How many items do you list on eBay daily? It says totally four. So I try and do at least 10, um, you know, and I'll list things as low as like sports cards for like four bucks a pop just to get, or th well, three bucks a pop. 295 is, is the lowest I'll go um, because it only takes about a minute or two to list and ship out uh, and it keeps traffic coming to my other listings, which is more important, right? Um, I don't want to fall into the trap of having like, even, I was thinking about it, and even if I had, let's say 10,000, um, 10,000, what's it called, listings on eBay, uh, and, the, and the average sale, pro and the average profit I made off those 10,000 listings was four bucks, and I had a 1% daily sell-through rate uh, that's still like, what is it? A hundred, a hundred cards a day. That would be in like an all day job. Times 0 0.001. Whoops. That's not right. Yeah. 10,000 times 1% is a hundred a day. So you know, the, at a certain point, even if you're doing low value items, if you have the ability to, to ship out a hundred things a day, um, it's really difficult not to make at least a thousand dollars a week. If you have 10,000 items of like any, anything really, uh, like, I guess you can look at examples of stores that sell like, um, like, uh, paper ephemera, like old ads and postcards. And they don't always, they sometimes have a hundred thousand active listings and they don't always do a thousand dollars a week. I was looking at a few and sometimes they go below that, but Jen, I mean, on average, they are making over 60 grand a year in their store. Um, it just goes to show. One of the most important things is listings, is to have, to have a lot of listings. Do people call and chat with you on StreamYard? Sa asks Annie. No, they do not. Occasionally, I have people come on the live stream. Uh, they have to have their camera up and we talk, but um, there is no call-in aspect. Happy Birthday says, from Salem, New Hampshire, how do you determine how to charge for shipping or have a higher price in free shipping? So if it's the kind of thing that I know how much it'll cost to ship, uh, and the cases like that are gonna be items under two pounds that are pretty small, um, anything under a pound, medium mail, and anything that fits into a flat rate mailer, be it a padded mailer or a box, 
Uh, I'm generally going to be including shipping in my cost and I'll just put down free shipping. But if it's something that's uh, an odd size, like a golf club that might cost $8 to go across, you know, to Michigan, but 25 bucks go to Alaska or Hawaii, uh, then I do not offer free shipping. Um, even though those sales to Alaska and Hawaii are few and far between, I just don't want to deal with it. Uh, the same goes for like uh, people, you know, if I have like hi I a pair of hiking boots that went to somebody in Washington state. So shipping ended up being like $45. Um, I was tempted to list them at $219 free shipping. I ended up listing, listing them at $219 shipping added. Uh, and I took a best offer. And sure enough, they went across the country. Um, so long story short, if it's not like, oh, I know how I'll ship this immediately. If it's not like I know what it'll cost, then I, I, I charge shipping. Um, I'm not selling a lot of stuff that is uh, high traffic stuff that's very big. Um, so, the, and the reason I bring that up is because free shipping certainly does improve your search uh, result placement for eBay search. And so like for things like books where I'm trying to sell a lot of them, I do offer free shipping, um, not solely to increase the, the search impressions, but just like, okay, it makes more sense that way. Uh, we've got, let's see, HyperX says, Taobao, what are your experience, if any, if not, thoughts on making purchases? So Taobao, I believe, is a like Alibaba, DHgate, private label brand. Um, you cannot, I, I am almost positive you can't sell on their listing pages. So what you'd be doing is either buying their branded stuff and selling on eBay or your own website or Mercari or wherever, or you'd be private labeling their stuff. Uh, so the same exact, you know, uh, injection mold, plastic body with wh whatever, your logo on top. Uh, and I recommend against doing that just because the margins on, when you're competing against a company that, that it sells tens of thousands of units a day, you know, across their whole catalog of items, across all their websites, and maybe it's less, but it's a huge amount of items. Um, they can afford to either permanently or uh, just temporarily, as you flounder, um, lower their prices to, to give you no margin at all. Um, if you do private labeling, what I always encourage people to do is have not only their own product style, but their own um, branding as well, like box that you ship it in and include that box in the image listing to avoid copycats jumping on there. It still might occur, uh, but doing things like that to uh, individualize your listing uh, are going to be very helpful. Let's see. The Tennis Chick says, For someone new to your channel, where do you start? To start listing items and getting friction. Uh, start by making an eBay account, a Mercari account, or an Amazon account, or ideally all three probably, uh, and just start listing things around your house, things you have that are extra. I sold my first set of golf clubs on eBay. Packing a full set of drivers and irons is stressful, says Purple Rube. Make sure that you have all of the club heads uh, either wrapped in some sort of protective paper or bubble wrap because that's what you're going to see damage is the club heads hitting each other and getting dings maybe and, and you know, jostling around. So as long as those are all fine, uh, the club, uh, you know, the grips of the club, if those bang around and touch, I can't imagine it causing any serious damage. Um, you know, you could even go so far as to make sure that like the bottom few inches of the hosel are protected too. But generally when I sell clubs, I'm doing them one at a time. I've only sold two or three full sets on eBay. Uh, with full sets, I usually sell them locally just because you can get about the same amount of money and there's no shipping fees and no eBay fees. But if it's an exceptionally rare set, uh, then I will go on eBay. And an example of that is my Ping Zing Biku irons that I sold like at this point three years ago. Question, says Baron Von Deals. What was the criteria you used to personally decide you needed a warehouse? I was getting um, freight shipments, and that was the biggest thing. Sales volume at the time, physical space away from your home, projected sales. So it had nothing to do with like 
sales volume or projected sales. I could afford it. I mean, so that was as far as that went, as far as the projected sales aspect, I could afford it. Um, I needed this because I wanted a place to be away from home uh, as well as I needed a place to receive uh, freight shipments. I was doing a lot more truckloads. I was doing a lot more importing back then. Um, as soon as I clear this out, I'm going to get back into that. Uh, and so I needed a place that I could get pallets delivered to. That was the biggest thing. In your opinion, when shipping bigger and heavier items, which is cheaper, FedEx or UPS? So FedEx and UPS rates are going to be determined by your location and the buyer's location. There's no like, oh, FedEx is cheaper, UPS is cheaper. They don't. Depending on where you are, either could be cheaper. Depending on you know details like that, um, that's how it's going to affect the uh, the price. So there's not like, once you have, you, you know, if you're in like Nashville, for example, probably FedEx is going to be cheaper. If you're in Atlanta, probably UPS is going to be cheaper. Um, but that's just because they have like regional hubs there. For me, most of the time, UPS is cheaper. Uh, but if they're going to like rural locations that are adjacent to hubs, then yeah, it's, um, you know, it's um, it's going to be cheaper. My name is Corey. It says, are copyright rules violated if you create your own original image of a copyrighted character on a t-shirt? I don't remember. So if you sell the photo, that's going to be illegal. Uh, and, and there are certainly websites like Amazon or eBay that will take down your listings. But in terms of like the actual, is it illegal? You're going to have to talk to a lawyer on that who uh, has experience with uh, fair use cases because I do not. The DC Picker says, hello, please tell me how to make a thousand bucks a week. Thank you in advance. Uh, so the DC Picker, I will gladly tell you. What you have to do is figure out uh, an item that makes you 20 bucks profit and sell 50 of those a week. It really is that simple. Um, a lot of people get caught up on that because they, I don't know why. But it really is as simple as just saying, here's how much money I want to make. Uh, it is not hard to find things to sell for 20 bucks profit. Um, and to sell, you know, 50 a week, uh, you, let's say you have a, a 0.025% sell-through rate. 0.02, whoops, 0, 0.025 uh, times 1,000. If you have a thousand active listings in a point uh, two and a half percent sell through rate, or sorry, a quarter of a percent sell through rate, you're going to be selling, let's see, uh, about 20 items a week. So you're going to want to have 3,000 items listed. You're going to sell seven point, you're going to sell eight a day, we'll say on average. Uh, and at that, at, at a point, at a quarter of a percent sell through rate, which I'd say, is probably a fourth of like what a standard reseller is going to have. Generally, I'll have an average about a one percent sell-through rate. If I continue listing things, um, you know, you're going to be making a thousand bucks a week with three thousand listings, uh, or or three thousand expected listings. You know, it can go. You can. When I was filming, I'm I'm going to post a video I think this weekend, uh, how to make a thousand bucks a week reselling Dollar Tree items, and. I had to refilm one of the parts of it because I kept saying you have to have a thousand different listings and you don't. All you have to have is is the is is make is make that many sales a day. And you could have easily have a 10% sell through rate or a 100% sell through rate on on certain items. Um, it's just a matter of hitting that. Uh, in this case, you know, seven or eight items a day, uh, and using that one percent as a standard is uh, is easy, but it also can, can be kind of confusing. Uh, let's see. Disney Black Diamond tapes for the win. Absolutely. <laughs> Dan says, is there a ballpark number on average for page views for an item on eBay before it gets an offer? No, there is not. Some things sell on their first view. Some things get hundreds, even thousands, and never sell. Uh, how do you sell used items on Amazon without an invoice? You just list it, and there you have it. Um... Are you going to be open up to the possibility that someone says, oh, it's fake and your account gets banned? Yes, you are, but those uh, do, that doesn't occur often at all. Dara says, I've yet to find an item that's a repeat seller that gives above $20 profit. 
Are you talking about multiple different items? Uh, so I, I think you're, re you're referring to Dollar Tree stuff. So in the Dollar Tree example, the profit numbers I used were smaller and you have to scale up higher. But in terms of repeat sellers that sell for more than 20 bucks, absolutely, I have found stuff that sells for more than 20 bucks. Um, you know, I, I, let, let, me, let me think. Uh, Super Smash Brothers, NCAA 14, NCAA 13. Um, Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm just naming off like sports games right now. Used video games. Tons of them you can get at thrift stores sell for more than $20 profit. Um, it's really, really simple that way. Uh, it's not, you know, private label, you know, if you're buying truckloads and you get a private label line, like one of the things that I've been selling for the past like ye year and a half are garden flags. I sell them for four, a 12 pack for 40 bucks a piece. And I got like 150 of those, um, on a, on a pallet. And so it's not like easy. They're not like, they're not going to like jump out at you. Um, because the stuff that's like easy at like retail stores, everyone else is doing it. And so your private, your, your product margin is going to, your profit margin is going to be lowered considerably, but, um, it's not hard at all to find things. I think 20 bucks is like a, a very, very easy number to hit in terms of profit. Midwest Picker says lunch and lurking. What percent of your business? How often are you doing clearance arbitrage? Walmart Walgreens says Nicholas. Zero currently. I'm doing zero clearance arbitrage right now. I wish I had thrift stores like some YouTubers. My scan everything has eBay up all the time. Firecrest, uh, you know, if you have bad stores around you, consider garage sales. Consider traveling to a larger area that has like 10 or 25 stores in a day, and you can just go to all those stores. Uh, consider buying um, uh, uh, Gaylords, you know, pallets of returns, stuff like that. Um, you know, if you buy uh, a Gaylord of returns, the issue that you can have is you have a lot of small items, and so you're not going to be making 20 bucks per small item. Uh, but at that point, your job become, becomes separating the bad stuff from the good stuff. When I go on Amazon to sell used items, Amazon doesn't let me without an invoice from the supplier, says Detroit99. Uh, I've never heard of that before. Um, what kind of things are you trying to sell? It probably means that you have a restriction for the brand. So it's not that you can't sell the item, it's you can't sell the brand, if that makes sense. Uh, try to list some used books. I have never heard anyone being denied the ability to sell used books on Amazon because of an invoice, uh, with the exception of textbooks or popular bestsellers. Okay. Got some good stuff down. So uh, we've got about 75 people here. We're a half hour in. Let's get some thumbs up on the video. And uh, any questions you have about how to make money, I would love to answer. Janice is here. Daryl is here. We've got, uh, let's see, Dara Gentry. Hello, hello. My full-time experience buying both thrift and arbitrage. Be willing to explore a 100-mile radius from home. Yeah, the furthest thrift store that I go to is about an hour and a half away, and I do it on a route of thrift stores. So it's like my last store that I go to, then I turn back. And generally, if I'm doing that, I'm taking all day to go sourcing, and um, you know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be spending between like three hundred and a thousand dollars usually. Uh, but that is um, that is just kind of I have I, like I said I I'm on a sourcing hiatus right now, and I don't think I'm gonna source the rest of the summer just because I've got so much stuff here that needs to be moved even after doing reseller boxes. Even after taking things to local auctions, I just have bought so many pallets of stuff and done so many buyouts and all that kind of stuff that I have I have too much, which is not a bad problem to have. Um, but if I keep buying stuff, then it does become a bad problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I have a question for you guys. What kind of stuff are you pursuing right now? What kind of things do you like selling? What kind of things are you going after? Um, because we can talk about that as well. How often do you think it has a positive ROI to run that all-day route? 
Oh, every, 100% of the time. If you go to like 10 thrift stores and you're not making money, then you don't know what you're looking for. Um, I've never, I've never ever had to be a net loss. I have trouble with inventory. I source once a quarter. Any advice? That sourcing trip has to go for about two weeks. <laughs> you have to, you have to drive over to Utah, uh, you know, and hit up all the stores along the way. Sony alarm clocks, direct TV converters says C Hill. Ken has been selling used shoes. A money asks, do you have an accountant for taxes? No, I do not. If not, how complicated is it doing your own? Not very hard at all. Maybe you have a video about that, setting up your business. I do not. I'm never going to go for my taxes because what if I get it wrong? Then there's evidence in the whole world that I screwed up. Um, not that I'm saying I think I did, but just like that seems like, first of all, that video would get like, a hundred views. It, nobody wants to watch that. Secondly, you're just like putting it out there forever. Um, so my advice is if you don't know how to do your own taxes, talk to a CPA. If you do, then no issue. You know, it's just how much money did I make? Oh, I have to give a third of that to the government. That is taxes. There's, you know, in a nutshell. Uh, Janice says, I've fallen off the wagon, haven't sourced or listed in forever. I never have a clue as to what I should be looking up. Uh, well, the way you learn what to look up is by looking up a whole bunch of stuff and keeping track of the profitable things and just pursuing that route. Nicholas says, I mean the same route weekly, once a month, coming up with three or route, four routes, doing once a week. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, whoops. Absolutely, I do that. Uh, I, you know, you can do the same thrift store. If it's a good thrift store that's getting new inventory every single day, you can do it every single day. Um, from what I've noticed in my area, and this differs by area. So you have to go to the stores and take notes on when they are putting out new inventory. And their schedule might change every quarter, or it might change as they get new managers. So like, this is gonna, this is like the work you're putting in. Uh, and you figure out, okay, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they, they swap, swap out toys and electronics. On Mondays and Wednesdays, they do coats and they do a rat clear. So, uh, you know, clearing the, like at, at Salvation Armies, for example, or Goodwills around here too, they have colored tags. And certain days of the week, they pull off every certain color tag. Um, and you just have to kind of be aware of this stuff because that's going to be your advantage is the information that you've uh, gleaned from doing your own research. I would recommend going into libraries once a week and check out what they are selling. I found a box of free VHS movies that was being given away. Uh, libraries are a great place to do it too. They have library sales. They've got, uh, you know, friends of library sales, all that kind of good stuff. Taxes is basically creative writing, says Griffin. Kind of, except if you write a bad book, you're not, you're not going to be sued by the government. <laughs> a Money says, meant more on the business, like an LLC, business license, etc., you know, you go to LegalZoom, this is the kind of stuff that I don't understand why people want to see it, because it's exceptionally boring. Like, watching someone go to LegalZoom and follow their tutorial on how to pay 150 bucks for an LLC, you know, it's just boring. Like, it's just, you have to do it. There's no, there's, it isn't, there's, there's no, um, skill to it. So there's skill with sourcing, there's a skill with writing listings, there's a skill with finding bolos. There is absolutely zero skill at all involved in going onto your you know, state's website and researching how to get a resale permit. There's absolutely no skill involved at all in going on LegalZoom.com and filling out an LLC. If you don't have the uh, energy to do that, then that's your problem. Not that you don't know how to do it, but that you're not willing to try this very simple procedure. Uh, the gray area says, my wife is staying home with our three-year-old. We have brainstormed how she could try her hand at sourcing and reselling. We can't decide where to start niche-wise. The best niche is the first, you know, is whatever's available to you. Um, you're going to learn very fast if things sell or they don't sell. And so rather than brainstorming, um, just start doing stuff, you know. Start with used books. That's a great place to start. 
uh, you know, and, and watch a lot of what sold videos. I think that what sold videos really don't are not used um, the way that I think they should be. People look at them as the person who made it, like trying to like show off all the things they sold, which is just absurd. Uh, what they're to be used for uh, is creating your own little like map of what sells. You look at the things they sold and you find similar items and you sell those items. Um, let's see. I'm looking for things I can source through retail arbitrage and possibly order them to be delivered. I can do some going out, but I'm sometimes limited. Uh, that's going to be tough because most of the things you can buy online and resell are going to have very small margins. Uh, the time it takes to get to you might erase that margin, and there's going to be massive competition unless you can find your own new niche. Any of these lists people sell, like online arbitrage lead lists, um, depending on how many people buy those, that's who your competition is. And I've seen those lists, and sometimes they have, like, you know, the sales rank is, like, 250000 in kitchen, and it sells for, like, a $2 profit. They're not very good. Um, if you can't leave your home, I think that you should be focused more on providing an online service as opposed to the kind of, uh, you know, arbitrage or resale that we see because no one is limiting the services you can do uh, or the, at least if it's individualized to your, to your own skills. Um, whereas, you know, with resale stuff, it is, it's, there's a lot more competition out there, especially for online arbitrage. Purple Rube says, I take a trip three, two or three times a year from Southern Minnesota to Sioux Falls. And it has always been profitable. Very good. Kendra says, I started in March and I've done $7,000 in sales since. How good is this? It's $7,000 worth. What's a good goal for the rest of the year for me? You want to figure out how much money you need. How, so wh what, whatever your monthly expenses are, multiply that by four. Okay? Or multiply it by five if you want to be safe. And then divide that by 12. And then that's going to be your monthly estimate for what you want to have. Um, let's see. There is a Goodwill on the other side of town that specializes in used electronics. It seems like a gold mine, but not sure how to get started. Any generic advice? Prices weren't amazing. Go there, look the things up by model number, uh, minus 12% for fees, minus the shipping cost, and that's going to be, depending on the size, between like 8 and $25. Uh, so if it's a large, like heavy VCR, just estimate 15 bucks shipping. If it's a very large 25 pound item, estimate 40 bucks shipping. Um, you know, the generic advice is just get out there and do it. Looking for people who sell pallets. There are tons of pallet sellers on the internet. Minneapolis in the building. We've got Gero Hustles, one of the Goodwill bins and police is being an asshole. And I hit him with, don't be a shithead. Yeah, a lot more folks could use that advice, I think. I think that would be good if more people just were not so shitty uh, and minded their own business. But that doesn't happen. All right, what else do we have going on? Who is all in the chat? We have, let's see, 80 people and 40 thumbs up. Let's get some more thumbs up. And if you're new, remember, please subscribe. We do these live streams every Wednesday. Uh, and I'm getting into the habit of Monday, what sold videos, and hopefully, if I can really get good, I'll be doing some sort of uh, how to make $1,000 a week doing retail arbitrage, doing Dollar Tree arbitrage, doing wholesale stuff, whatever, uh, on Fridays. And what that's basically going to boil down to is a brief walkthrough, maybe four or five minutes, and then the second part of the video is going to be, and here's the numbers you have to hit to make $1,000 a week. Because what I'm realizing doing these live streams is a lot of people don't know the $1,000 is just 20 times 50 or 10 times 100 or 500 times two. And once you have that information, it becomes very easy to figure out like what the right way to do it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Daryl says, what do you think about going through my inventory a couple times a year and cleaning out inventory to make a pallet for both clearing space and recovering some cash? Um, the issue with that is it's difficult to sell pallets 
just like on eBay. And if you go to like bstocksupply.com, I think they charge 200 bucks a month, if I recall correctly. Jackie asks, hi Blake, is it hard to get ungated for products on Amazon? Depends on the product or the brand. Uh, and when they need invoice, does that mean the receipt you get when you bought the product? No, receipts are not invoices. Receipts are receipts. Uh, been doing pretty good with retail arbitrage. About to get into the wholesale side, says Noah. Um, Dara Gentry. So if you do Dollar Tree retail arbitrage, most of the Dollar Tree retail arbitrage in store products, not all, but most, are going to be available uh, on DollarTree.com. So you can check DollarTree.com, buy things in quantities of 100, let's say, you know, for example, and then all of a sudden you have a quantity listing. Uh, and, and if you have, again, I'll, I like to use a 1% sell-through rate. So that means every 100, uh, well, let's just say you have 100 items. Uh, that means you sell one a day. Assuming they all occur at the same rate, that means you sell one item about every three months a little bit longer, which is not, you know, that, that's a very bad sales history. <coughs> Excuse me. So anything that sells, you know, when you look up the, the, the sold comps, anything that has like four or five sold comps in the past 90 days, um, that might justify buying two or three or four. And if you can find 100 items like that that sell two every, you know, that will, for you will sell two every 90 days, uh, you are well on your way to making some good money. How do you get invoices for Amazon? Uh, it's going to depend on um, who you're buying it from, but generally it's going to be from either a distributor or the actual manufacturer. Hey, we got five bucks from Steve. For those of you who don't know, when we get a super chat, we hit this bell right here. So thank you, Steve. Steve says, I have a friend with thousands of great sports cards that are ungraded. PSA is not accepting cards. Best idea on the highest value. Well, I'll give you an example because obviously the values are going to range from worthless to tens of thousands of dollars potentially. <coughs> Excuse me. So this card right here is a 1998 Upper Deck Collector's Choice. Kobe Bryant, uh, you know, third year card. If this card were just like regular, I'd say it's worth like 10 bucks probably. But this is actually the, uh, what's it called? Choice Reserve. You can't even really tell. But there is like um, a hologram kind of writing that says Choice Reserve. And that changes the value of this card from between about 70 bucks to 200 bucks, ungraded. Um, it costs, you know, it used to be that on low value cards, grading it added about like 30 bucks on high, you know, but that's not really. Um... <laughs> Griffin says fake news. They are accepting cards, but it's 300 bucks. I mean, so I, I get what they were saying. They were saying they're not accepting cards for the typical programs that people would, would use to get their cards graded. Um, you know, the, the kind of cards that would, you know, like PSA 10s that would have sold for 100 bucks maybe, uh, you know, like a year ago. Like, a, like a, you know, a 1990 Fleer Jerry Rice PSA 10, I think sells for like 75 or 100 bucks right now. So, like, cards like that are just, even though they're relatively rare, are just not worth getting graded, obviously. Is there a general website? Is there a website that lists the general worth of sports cards? Asks Dara. eBay.com does. Uh, yeah. So, but the, anyways, the highest value. Uh, there really is no. There's not like general rules. Just because uh, a card being a parallel or a card being, you know, uh, 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 have, having a serial number printed on it is going to make the value change considerably, or can. Yeah, so all you have to do to look them up is just put in the name of the card. So when you're when you're looking up a card, three think three key features matter, right? Mainly three. Uh, there's obviously the attributes that you can add to a listing. Go on, go on and on and on. But generally, if you're looking up basic cards, 
what you have to know is the player's name. So in this case, Kobe Bryant. You have to know the card number. In this case, it's 69. And you have to know what the brand or the series is. In this case, that's Upper Deck, Collector's Choice, or just Choice, I guess. Upper Deck, Choice. Um, so you type in Upper Deck, 1998, Kobe Bryant, 69. Uh, and you put those numbers in, and it's going to show you the card. Now, there are more details. right? Like, look at this card right here. This is an Alec. Uh, I wish I had examples um, with, with the base card, but I don't. So I'm just going to show you uh, another example, right? So when you look at sports cards, there's things called Parallels 2, which is the same card with a slight alteration. So here's a Tua uh, rookie or second year card, and then here's an Alec Ingold card. These are both 2021 score football cards, but this is what they call a gold parallel, basically. And that's going to affect the value of a card as well. Now, does it affect the card at a fixed rate? No, it does not. Um, that Alec Ingold gold parallel is probably worth about the same as the regular Alec Ingold card, which is like nothing. Um, so you have to just take, you know, it's going to, I would say I've been buying and selling cards on eBay, like as a hobby where I take time every day to look at stuff for like, six months not now and i'm only now just starting to like understand all of the nuances like uh for example in the bowman 2021 chrome baseball card there were two parallel refractors that looked very similar mojo and rapture uh they're both like um i don't think i have any on me i don't have any cards here but they're they're both like silver refractors but the pattern differed minutely. Uh, and so uh, just like details like that are what just takes being in contact with the cards and just like looking at things to, uh, you know, understand or at least to have like melted into your brain osmatically. Uh, yeah, I think eBay has built in a scan feature that will recognize cards now, says Noah. I don't think it's for sports cards. I think that's only for, like, Pokemon and Magic cards. Or maybe just Magic cards. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Is eBay good with that on things like Yu-Gi-Oh! and other collectible cards? Yeah, you know, I was looking up 1992 Pacific Garfield trading cards because supposedly they had Jim, what, Jim Davis. Jim Davis was the cartoonist for Garfield. Supposedly they have Jim Davis autographs in those boxes of cards. And the Jim Davis autographs go for like 50 bucks and I saw the cards going for, a, a box of cards going for like 20 bucks. And so I was like, oh, is there, you know, maybe there's one autograph per box and you can make money here. You couldn't do that. Um, but there was a, for being an esoteric market like that, there was definitely still a lot of sales going on. Uh, let's see, where were we? Do you ever buy hobby boxes from the retailer or card company? Or are you just buying secondhand? So I have not bought any hobby boxes yet. I almost pulled the trigger on a score 2021 hobby box. I could have bought one for 295 bucks with free shipping which is lower than the retail price um, by $5. But I did not. Uh, I just said, you know what? Probably not a good idea. Um, I even got Yoke says score is hot garbage. I, you know, it isn't though. Like the cards are selling really good. Like it's the first, uh, yeah, it's the first NFL set to come out. So for like two months every year, score is like the, the best you can get. Um, because the, like right now I believe, well, I guess there's legacy, but that's harder to get right now in terms of licensed NFL cards. I believe the only retail sets out there are score legacy. Is there, is there 2021 Chronicles out or is that still last year? Uh, and now I think draft picks contenders draft picks came out on June 9th. I just bought five boxes of uh, Contenders draft picks on Target uh, for 20 bucks a pop, even though they're only selling for like $28 a pop on eBay.
Um, as more and more cards come out, as they create, you know, runs of players in their licensed NFL jersey. So like Donruss and Mosaic and uh, Prestige and Absolute and uh, Contenders, just regular Contenders. As those series come out, you see the draft pick only cards or like the early year cards, like the scores, really shoot in value. Um, I haven't got Yoke says, Chronicles is last year. I just saw that Packer Cards posted a video um, of 2021 Score Chronicles, though, and they were NFL cards, so maybe it was a typo. I returned a boatload of score cards last year. I've never heard of anybody returning cards. Uh, I wish I held it. would have doubled up easy. Oh, yeah, score 2020 uh, blaster boxes are going for like 60 bucks right now. It's pretty crazy. Or at least they're going for 60 bucks like two months ago. No clue where it is now. Um, TD Baseball Cards says eBay is the best place to sell cards because it gets the most views. Other sites have more limited views. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, um, you know what I've noticed too is going up is, is, uh, you can buy sealed fat packs, uh, on Target and Walmart.com, like, like, not master cases, but like 12 packs of value packs, uh, and I think those are going for a premium too because they have box hits. It isn't a case hit, but it's a box hit because you have 12 in the box, um, and so what I'm also saying people do, and this is like kind of shady, I mean, I mean, whatever, it's their property, I, but I'm just not buying value packs, is you see a listing, uh, score value packs, 11 packs in total, um, and it was a 12-pack box. And you're like, okay, well, I know what you did. Like, you pulled out the, the best, you know, you weighed all the packs, and you pulled out the auto card. Um you know, whatever, more power to them. I don't give a shit, but I'm just saying, like, I'm not buying those. And I think people who are are just going to be disappointed. I've got, uh, I'm, my worst retail buy was Donruss Elite Extra Edition baseball cards, which I do not, I don't watch baseball, so I don't know why the cards are not worth more money. I just don't get it. Like, this card, I'm going to show you one right here. It's a jersey card, uh, but it's uh, Leody Tavares, and I sold this guy's rookie Bowman Chrome for $8. So why the heck is that card worth $8, and this is worth nothing? Um, I don't understand why they're not worth more. A lot of aspects in the trading card and the sports card world are extremely arbitrary and have nothing to do with how many things, how many were printed or any of that kind of stuff. Um, like uh, the fact that... I'll use Young Guns as an example. The fact that um, Dazzlers in, in, in Upper Deck Hockey, the fact that Dazzlers sell for less than Young Guns is crazy because they have an equally large uh, like set run, and Dazzlers are 1 in 10, and Young Guns are 1 in 4. It just makes absolutely no sense at all. I don't get it. Uh, I've got a bunch of late 80s, early 90s cards, mostly basketball, should I sell them individually or sell as lots, says Featherston. So if they're late 80s, there's a big, 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 big difference from like a 1987 Fleer to a 19, even 1990 Fleer is getting more and more in value. Um, so what I would say is go through there, pick out the Hall of Famers, uh, and then sell the rest on an auction, and you're going to get maybe, you know, five bucks per thousand cards. Um but pick out the Michael Jordans, pick out the Akeem Olajuwans, pick out the Sean Kemp rookies, pick out the Gary Payton rookies, pick out the Reggie Miller rookies, uh, pick out the Scotty Pippins, pick out the Larry Birds, and sell those cards individually because, like, uh, I, I bought a whole, whole, whole bunch of 1990, um, oh, shoot, not Fleer. I wish it was Fleer. 1990 Hoops. 1990 Hoops cards. I bought, um, I had about 150 packs. And they were fire damage packs. They had been like in a uh, a trading card store that burnt down. I think I assume I have no clue, or they were just near, close to the heater. I don't know. Uh, and out of all those cards, I pulled out the Michael Jordans. I pulled out the and then the rookies and the Larry Birds and the Olajuwans. 
And like, for example, um, the Gary Payton 1990 Hoops Rookie is selling for about five bucks if it's in good condition. And if they're pack poles or if they've been, you know, taken care of, that is going to, you're going to get that money for it. Um, you know, not huge numbers, but there are so many good players who are in the Hall of Fame in those classes that I think if you, you know, just pull out the, the great players, sell those individually, you're not going to get more than, if they're just like raw cards, you're not going to get more than 100 bucks per card. And like 100 bucks is like, I'm just going way above what I've seen because I don't know what like the 88, 89 uh, Fleer Jordans go for. Ungraded, I have no idea. Um, I bought, let, let, like, let's say I bought a 1980, 89 Fleer sticker Jordan in a lot of cards. And I auctioned that off four months ago and I got uh, about 40 bucks for it. Uh, it was in pretty bad condition. So like there's going to be more value in those players, but the vast majority of cards, because those, those sets were like 400 plus cards, I think, or at least the ones that I've seen were very, very big. So most of the cards, because they had like, not only did they have players, they had like headlines, they had coaches, they had teams, they had checklists, they had kind of like stupid inserts that no one cared about. Um, those are pretty much worthless, but there are a select number that are, are worthwhile. Uh, let's see. Panini is unlicensed in baseball, so they can't use logos. That's why they are valued less. People don't like the airbrush picks. I don't understand that. I just don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't, I've, I've heard people say, oh, it looks plain. I'm just like, but, but the reason I like sports cards is because, okay, here's a set, you know, because they're valuable because they have the absolute scarcity. And so like one of these, whatever, like, uh, is this a numbered card? It is. Dane Acker autograph out of 189. This card, in my opinion, should be just as valuable as any other Dane Acker out of 189 autograph. But it's not. It, and there's no, you know, there's no denying it's not. And that's just because of, like, uh, consumer tendencies that I think are arbitrary and I think are going to be eroded over, you know, the next decade. Especially if we see like Panini and Tops and Upper Deck with hockey re up there. Upper Deck is a bit different, but like Panini and Tops, if we see them, um, if we see th them re sign their exclusive deals, I think that people are going to care less and less and less about if the card is licensed and they're going to care more about the scarcity of it. Um, yeah, Topps has the license until, 20, I read that too, until 2022. Uh, and then I think Panini is until 2024 with, um, or 2025. I forget. 2020, 2014, I, I'm pretty sure is the last year Topps did football. Um, but again, I, I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head. Um, yeah, pitchers are nothing good. I also don't get why pitchers are not the most valuable baseball card because in, from as like someone who just watches baseball casually, the pitchers and the designated hitters, the people who have very specialized jobs, for me, that's like the most interesting aspect of baseball. But it is not. I don't know why it's not. Um, Kevin says 2015 might be the last year for Tops, for Tops uh, football. Last year, Tops football. Because I'm pretty sure Panini did a 10-year deal. So this is sportscardsuncensored.com, RIP Tops Football. Upper Deck departed from football in 2010. And it looks like, I'm just trying to skim the article to see, they don't say how long Panini's exclusive deal with the, uh, with the NFL is. I'll Google that. Panini exclusive deal. License. They also, not to mention the NBA license, too. Shit. This was a blog post from last year. They announced a long-term extension for collegiate trading cards. Who's buying those? That's another thing I don't get. Who's buying collegiate trading cards? Like, you see the Panini Blaster boxes for, like, uh, you know, Auburn or Clemson. But they... The, they only have like 80 players. I don't get it. 
Antiques from Karen says, new subscriber, I inherited a hoarded house full of antiques and vintage. Really tough to keep momentum going while working a 40 hour Monday to Friday job. Came over to see if you saw that kind of stuff. I have sold it, but in your situation, the obvious answer is go to an estate sale company. If you have a nine to five, there's no way that you as an individual are gonna be able to clear out a hoarder's house unless you like have your own like staging area where you pull stuff out of the hoarder's house and stage it and take photographs and then organize it. That's just, I. that's why I have so much shit because I have things from like hoarders and from like messy divorces and that kind of stuff where it just, it becomes overwhelming very, very fast. And so I think if you have the chance and they really are valuable antiques, talk to an estate sale company, talk to a local auction. Um, if you tell me what, what region you're in, uh, then maybe I can give you some leads on auction companies. I made about 80 bucks in a collegiate cello box of college baseball. Yeah, I don't understand who's buying those. Like, I was looking up, so there's a long snapper for the Detroit Lions named Don Mulbach, who's been in the league for like 20 years. And I wanted to see if he had any sports cards. And he only has one, um, one card. Uh, and that's the 2015 Texas A&M Panini Collegiate Set. Uh, and it's base card, and then the parallel out of 10, and then maybe a parallel out of 99 as well. But just like, I don't, I mean, it, it just, it's very interesting. That, that, that market and that industry. Uh, no estate sale company possible, too much value. I've been at it three years, talked to several upstate New York. Well, I have to, I mean, without knowing the value, you, you have to look at it and say, okay, there's too much value. I assume that your fear is that you're not going to get as much as you want from it, or this estate sale is going to sell things too cheap. Um, maybe there's a different issue. Maybe you're worried about theft. I don't know. Uh, but if it's taken you three years to go through this stuff, you know, what's the opportunity cost of those three years? Or let's say you predict it'll take you 10 years to go through all this stuff. What's the opportunity cost of those 10 years versus uh, what you would lose paying in fees or, uh, you know, whatever other issues you're worried about at an estate sale? Um, just because it just seems like an overwhelming task that will is not the best use of one's time. Again, I don't, I don't know your individual situation, um, but if you are talking about ways to make as much money as possible with your inventory and it's a hoarder house full of stuff, uh, then you're going to have to delegate and you're going to have to be okay with um, not making all the money you can because you, you'll have more free time, for example. Uh, let's see, doing fairly wells with live sales on my channel, but hoping to move things fast. You're going to have to delegate uh, and you're going to lose money on fees. And that's just, you know, that's what you're doing is you're paying to have that money sooner when you use an estate sale company. Hershack is in Vermont, Wilston, just side of Burlington. They could do an auction for you. So there we go. Hershack auctioneer. Uh, you, what overwhelming task is not the best of one's time opening thousands of cards and hoping to sell them. Oh yeah. So I, I've said this earlier, um, in other videos, sports cards, that's like my hobby. After I do my other listing stuff, then I do sports card stuff and I keep track of the profits because I just like doing that. But uh, like when I do like my resale videos, I exclude sports cards out of those because in my opinion, it is not a viable way to make a lot of money unless you have like 10,000 listings up and you're relisting, you know, 100 or 200 cards a week. And even then, um, you're going to be limited by a lot of factors. Elliot says, I have MJ meltdown card. Oh, okay, okay, so Michael Jordan meltdown card. And Metal Universe card, they are pretty pricey, so thinking about selling it individually. Lately, I've been focused on cleaning out my inventory to make more room. Yeah, um, you know, it's, uh, I personally uh, am just sell cards as I get them. 
Uh, you know, there are a few exceptions, like when it comes around the playoffs or it comes uh, a season's ending or a season's beginning where I might hold out or I might auction a card off. But generally, um, if, if you have the listings up and you have them at a market price, uh, the amount of money that you're missing out on by like selling it now as opposed to five years from now, if you just take that money and reinvest it a few times, it'll easily surpass what you would have gotten holding off for five years or whatever. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Baron. It's a f two more years of a timeline to go through the house. Learning it all as I go. I do sell lots to resellers. Yeah, that certainly is a way to do it too. Uh, I, I've sold, I sold about 50 resale lots out of here. And um, the issue now is most of the items I have are a little bit too big. Like I've got about 50 Guitar Hero guitars that I'm thinking about wholesaling to someone, but I don't know how I would ship them. They'd have to come pick them up, uh, I think. You know, I just want to sell like 50 cards or 50 of these guitars, 10 bucks a pop, and just you know, get out, get out of that, uh, get get out of my warehouse. Um, <clears throat> where do you sell your lots? I, I sold them, uh, I just had a PayPal link. I had them on my website, and I had a PayPal link, and then that's how I did it. Uh, but I, before, I've also used Shopify too. What is the best time to clean out your inventory, and how long should you have an item before you just get rid of it? So it really depends on the item, and depends on your own personal uh, you know, preferences. So like Flip the World, Chris, they anything that doesn't sell in a month, they get rid of. They're OCD like that. It's crazy. Uh, for me, uh, like, let, let's use football cards as the example. What I'm going to do this year is I'm going to have all my football cards listed uh, until about probably December of 2021. Um, so this is going to be like Score, Donruss, Contenders, um, elite maybe depending on when they come out. Just like the, the cards that come out be, like before the season starts or in the early part of the season. Uh, and then once like G um, December hits, I'm gonna auction off all those cards as there's a lot more talk about like MVP candidates and uh, you know rookie of the year candidates and that kind of stuff. Because what I learned last year is that once the season's over and once the next year's draft starts, uh, a lot of the speculative rookie buying is just gone, completely gone. Um, so like, let's say, what I I thought that if I held the I, I I just I don't know why I didn't list them. It was mostly me just being like I'm gonna wait to see what happens. It was kind of dumb. I should have listed it earlier. Uh, but like for example, a Cam Akers running back card, which is a, a pretty much a no name, um, a no name running back, you know, who will probably not sign anything beyond his rookie contract in the NFL. Maybe you know a one a few one or two year deals. But he's nothing special. Nothing, nothing like fancy, right? That card was going for like three or four bucks pretty routinely during the season. And now sales are few and far between, um, you know, at like two or three bucks. And like these are small numbers, right? But it, it, it still proves the trend. Let's see. Flip the world can use that quick flip mentality on the items he gets from dumpster diving. Oh yeah, I mean that also is, I, I'm paying, or he is paying so little for the items that it's okay. Um, Ivan got yoke says I'd agree with the exception of baseball and hockey too. Takes guys a couple years to level up. Like if you have a hockey guy who who's doing real, like well for example this card right here, Ka Kirill Kaprizov Young Guns. He's a rookie uh, who's doing very well in the NHL, but that's because he played like six years in the KHL, which is um, Russia's professional hockey league. Uh, but yeah, it all that's what it all comes down to. That's, I mean, sorry about that deep dive into sports cards. Um, kind of annoying, right? If you don't like that stuff. But I think it's, uh, you know, the, you have to learn niches if you want to excel at any area of resale. If there are any more questions, I would love to answer those. It can be about anything else. Let's we've had we've talked enough about sports cards. Let's talk about uh, electronics. Let's talk about um, 
you know, clothing potentially. We can talk about selling rocks. We can tell about selling jewelry. We can talk about selling, I don't know, what else do I have around here? Books, DVDs, video games. I have all those things listed and I can talk about them. Oh, so sore. My electronic strategy as of recently has been non-existent. Can you discuss your experience private labeling? Uh, my experience was good until a bunch of copycats jumped on um, and uh, other resellers, um, and Amazon at the time was not very helpful. Um, private labeling, I think, <coughs> is a lot easier now in 2021 than it was two or three years ago because there's so much more brand protection on Amazon. Um, but it's uh, all you really do is you find a company who makes something and you have them make a few alterations with the design and the logo and then you buy it and you're going to be buying large quantities, you know, so usually I think the smallest I've ever bought of a quantity is 144 and that was 12, 12 packs of knives, um, like hunting knives. And uh, that was, um, you know, it's fun. It's fine. It's kind of boring because you're just doing the same thing over and over again. But it's uh, a great way to make money. Do anything for Prime Day? No, I did not. What other ways have you tried to make money online? I have done a lot of stuff. Uh, so before I was doing YouTube stuff, uh, I had an SEO business. I did, you know, content marketing. Um, whenever I've had like jobs where I've worked like a nine to five job, it's always been in mar in marketing, excuse me, um, like SEO marketing. So like on page content, um, you know, I've, I've sold mystery boxes. I've sold services in like, you know, SEO audits, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've done copywriting. Uh, I did stand up comedy for a while. That's a bad way to make money. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much money I made, maybe 500 bucks over doing it for like two years. Um, I've sold, uh, print on demand t-shirts. I've sold print on demand bumper stickers. I've wholesaled stickers to bookstores. Uh, I have wholesaled, I, I published a book about 10 years ago and I sold that to bookstores and tourist stores. Uh, hell yeah. You ever make made for AdSense sites? Uh, you know, a long time ago I, I tried it, but really it is not that lucrative. Maybe it is now. Um, you know, I was thinking about getting back into content marketing in 2021, but I don't know. <clears throat> Let's see. I think all about it all the time. How you say you have to do one thing on you to be successful, but it's more fun to do everything. It's so true. Yeah. Jim said sold 25 pairs of rainbow mouse earrings, paid 15 bucks. Sold for 50 a piece. Very nice. Uh, what are your thoughts on Facebook Marketplace? It's fine. You know, no, no, nothing negative, nothing, nothing positive. Just it's another place to sell stuff. How long did it take to make that first eBay sale? Boy, I have no idea. My first eBay sale was over a decade ago. It was over. It was like 15 years ago at this point. Uh, have 24 items listed so far. When looking at completed sales, do you take advantage and use it for your price? Yes, absolutely. I'm going off the market price. Um, and if you have 24 items listed and you're listing a little bit every day, uh, you should see your first sale shortly. Uh, MFA sites used to be lucrative, not now. I never saw them, you know, as being lucrative. Like I never, I did a few uh, AdSense sites and I never made more than like a dollar or two a day. And it was just like, basically, when I was doing this in like 2012 to 14, all the, the way you would do it, this was after, um, maybe it was, yeah, it, maybe it was 13 to 15. Because it was after uh, the YouTube algorithm change where you had to have a lot more contextual keywords. But all I was really doing was just like writing blog posts all day. And you couldn't delegate that to like uh, virtual assistants. Um, because they didn't have uh, a, a high enough understanding or, or, you know, capacity of the English language to have that nuanced contextual keyword stuff. 
YouTube killed my kids' content channel. Put too much sweat equity into those channels. Spent thousands. Squashed like a bug. Yeah, I stay away from anything related to kids. Um, you know, it's uh, not a good idea. Have you ever done anything with silver bullion or selling coins? I sell a lot of coins. Never sold silver bullion. Can you make your own content on your own site and make a subscription? Uh, you could do that, but I don't think it's a good idea unless you have either a, a, a huge knowledge of a topic or an existing audience. Mom Ben Ups should have hired me. The issue with hiring people to write for you is that anyone who is good at it is going to charge too much. Um, really, to make this pro to, to make most content sites pos uh, profitable, you can't initially for the first like year almost. You can't spend more than like five bucks, you know, uh, per like thousand words really, um, just because you're gonna be doing so many different things that unless you're fine investing like five or ten thousand dollars into a uh, um, you know a, a, a deep content library, um, you know it's just not doable. What is your strategy to get all of your unlisted inventory listed? Looks like an organizer's dream. Uh, I just go through it and I um, uh, and I uh, list it. <laughs> That's all I really do. There's no there's no big strategy to it. I just go through it and I list it. I start off and I pull things away and then I put things on the table over here and I pull things away and I you know just go through it. I've made a bunch buying aquarium rock in bulk and selling on Amazon and Etsy, says Forrest Kane. That's a great private label idea right there. <clears throat> what was the last item you sold? I just sold a book. Uh, what, what was the title? The, it was an Edgar Allan Poe like anthology from the early 1900s, and I sold it for $12.95. I've made a bunch buying a. Oh, that was the thing I just said. Yeah, uh, all the old books I have are from the book truckloads I did like two years ago, three years ago almost. Uh, and so um, they're all like old antique books that I couldn't list on Amazon because there either was no listing or they were just so old that it didn't make sense. Um, but yeah, that's actually what I have to do today is I have to go through a bunch of old books, a bunch of DVDs and list all of those. So we are just about at the 90 minute mark. I'm gonna get out of here. Uh, last call for questions. Uh, and everyone who showed up, thank you very much. Remember, give the video a big thumbs up and uh, come back every Wednesday at noon. Again, we're gonna do a last call for questions. Uh, what's the key to selling books? I have listed tons on both Mercari and eBay, but they don't seem to sell much. So the key to books is to have a lot listed. Uh, just because unless you have like bestsellers or popular books or unless you are going out and sourcing books individually, um, you're probably going to have a lot of like long tail traffic. So you're going to want to have, you know, I would say w that, that 1% sell through rate on like books is not, it's probably too high. You're probably going to be, um, a lot lower on books. Where did you sell the Poe book? Says Ivan got books on eBay. Uh, yeah, eBay, so I'm only going to pay $2.89 media mail. A lot of those lower value books just aren't worth it on Amazon. Um, I mean, I'm only making like 10 bucks on this, I guess. But it's, uh, you know, when I list these, I'm just taking like one or two or three pictures, uh, listing low value stuff. And for me, that's like anything below like 40 bucks probably um, is just going to be, I'm trying to get as many things listed as possible. And so I don't really care about the quality of pictures or listings. Like the other day, um, the other day I had someone comment on a, a, a sports card I had listed because there was a small error on the listing. Uh, and they wanted to ask me why I kept that error on the listing despite being notified. And I didn't even respond to them because the card sold during our conversation. I wouldn't have responded anyways because I'm not going to waste my time talking to somebody about what I'm doing on eBay, on eBay. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but little, little errors, little typos, all that stuff doesn't really matter. 
Um, I I don't think like maybe you know like let's say on a on a book I sold a uh, a copy of Le Peste in French by Albert Camus or yeah Camus Camus I don't know how to say it um, but I spelled his last name wrong <laughs> I sp I spelled it C A M I S and the book still sold in a week so just like uh, you know don't don't let like the fear of having oh, my pictures aren't perfect, or oh, like, you know, I don't know everything about this. Don't let that stop you. It's not a big deal. Uh, for the vast majority of things, it'll sell, the person, they're going to see the picture, and they're going to want it, or they're not going to want it. Uh, you know, if you're a clothing seller, I'm sure it's a bit different, but for the things that I sell, I don't think it's that big of a deal. All right, guys. Well, we are out of here. Thanks for stopping by. And I will see you next week.